we're getting there. <laughs> oh God, my heart's desire is... I wonder how you'd finish that sentence. Well, the passage that Manny read for us takes us into a prayer that really does show what our heart's desire is. came across uh, an image of a billboard you know those huge you know how big are they 40 foot long billboards uh, and this one is uh, presented as a message from God to people and so God says every day I get more prayer requests for car parking spots than for anything else you people need to start thinking bigger now I need to confess I pray for car parking spots. So it's not saying it's a bad thing, but there's got to be more to our prayers. Now, when you do pray for a car parking spot, <laughs> stay within the, the spot. If it's narrow, don't try and go there at all because you get into the habit of parking in a certain way and when you get a good spot you just mess it up remember only one car per spot and when you reverse out of your car parking spot make sure the car behind you doesn't have anything written on the side uh, I can't explain that that's just beyond logic I, I, I don't get that D don't park like this now, what a happy scene. Look, happy flowers in the foreground, happy sunny sky in the background. Even the number plate of the car says, happy car. I just can't help but think that there's something not quite right about the situation. Don't park like this. You've been told, and it's true, Never drive into water because you don't know how deep the puddle might be. It's true, as you can see. This girl wisely took that advice and did not drive into the water. <laughs> now, mind you, how she got out without getting her feet wet is something of a mystery. This is a stormwater channel. It looked dry at the time. But things are subject to change without notice. Now this person, unable to find a parking spot in the car park, <laughs> wisely parked in the smash repair workshop, which as you can see is appropriately named <laughs> Collision Concepts. Parking spots can be something of a surprise. There are places where you shouldn't park. You've been told, look, don't, don't park next to, for example, a fire hydrant. The, the fire brigade might need to use that. There are other places where you shouldn't park, even if they're designated. N never been a situation where you need to park somewhere like that. And it might look like a great open spot, but if it's designated for someone else, don't park there. Uh, the sign said all vehicles must angle park rear to the curb he should have prayed for a parallel parking spot even though I know they're sometimes difficult to get into <laughs> and with the huge advances of technology your next mode of transport may be able to park itself <laughs> remember the sign every day I get more prayer requests for car parks than for anything else. You people need to start thinking bigger. Now, it's a great sign because it's funny and it's serious at the same time. Yep, feel free to park, pray for car parks. But let's not limit ourselves. Now, I was really, really encouraged in the middle of our service. We had this open prayer time. We're a church that has a culture of prayer.
prayer. And here in our, our passage today, we get to see something of the power that prayer has. It can do so much more because God can do so much more than find you a car parking spot. He wants to do things, give you rest, transformation, life, hope, health, focus, uh, miracles, protection, relationship, revelation, purpose, grace, blessing. The list is so big. Why would we limit ourselves to just little things? So let's come and have a look at this text that we've got before us today. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. It opens with, For this reason I kneel before the Father. And so here we are coming to meet God in prayer with this attitude of humility. He can do so much more than give us car parking spots or heal our sore, whatever it is that's aching most at the moment. There are three things that we're going to look at and you can follow these in your outline sheet. In the opening few verses, Oh God, I desire a heart of faith. This is what is prayed for, first of all, a heart of faith. Look at our, our text. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your innermost being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And see, this is the purpose. Why are we praying? What's the, the goal of prayer? The words so that show that here's the purpose, here's the reason, this is what it's all about. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, through your trust in him, through your reliance upon him, in your relationship with him. It's, prayer is about building relationship. It, it looks a bit like this. Now, I have to think with pictures. Now, I love diagrams, as you probably know by now. Uh, how do you get from, I pray that out of his glorious riches, in one side, over to dwell in your heart through faith on the other side? Mostly it's about God's resources for me and a little bit about me receiving him. And it works just like the text says in verse 16. It's, first of all, out of his glorious riches, we are strengthened with his power. He's got everything that we need, but he doesn't keep it to himself. He's strengthening us. He's giving us what we need, the resources that we need to be able to live abundantly. And then out of that strength, there comes the work of his Holy Spirit who is wanting to live within us, to dwell within us, in our innermost being, not just to touch us around the edges in some superficial way, but in your inner being, to go deeper and deeper into who you are. For what purpose? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You know, one of my very favourite words, is the word dwell. A dwelling is a home. It's not just a residence. It's not just a roof. It's not just walls and somewhere where you put your furniture. A dwelling is where you dwell, where you settle down, where you can kick your shoes off and it's comfortable, it's at home. That's the whole purpose. So that Christ can be so comfortable within you within your heart, within your mind, within your habits, within your choices, that he feels comfortable and he dwells there through the faith that we have, the invitation that we give to him, the openness that we are to him. And that's where it becomes me. All of the rest of this was God is offering this to us, pouring this out to us, flooding us with all of these things that are so good for us. And we've got to say, okay, I will accept that. That's what faith is saying. Yes, I'm willing to take all this in board. But it works back the other way as well because out of a, a heart of faith where Christ is indwelling, his character starts to show in our lives and the indwelling Holy Spirit becomes the outward expression through the fruit of the Spirit. 
so that the strength that has been poured into us is poured back out and we get to experience his glorious riches in who we are, who we are becoming and what we are doing, the relationships we have, the choices that we make and the things that you've shared today in prayer points, the needs, the genuine needs that are there, the the hopes and the hurts. Out of Christ dwelling within us, there comes all of this, the strength to be able to deal with the things that we need to cope with day by day. And so it comes down to this. The difference between who I am now and who I really want to be in my heart of hearts is not what I wish, it's not what I hope, it's not even what I pray, it's not what I choose, it's what I actually do. It doesn't happen until it's done. You need to actually put it into practice. And then I move from who I am now to not only who I want to be, but who God wants me to be. In my heart of heart, they're exactly the same thing because that's where his spirit is indwelling. It's where Christ is being formed within me. But I'm part of God's team. I need to do what he wants me to do. And then we move into the next couple of verses. Oh God, I desire a heart of love because faith and love always go together. From the end of verse 17, I pray that you being, and look at how it pops up, rooted and established in love. May have the power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up with the measure of the fullness of God it's love love and love it's one of faith but it's three of love as we put into practice what faith looks like at home at work in relationships in the real world it's making those deliberate love choices And we are to be rooted and grounded in love where we sink down into God's love who we are so that we can grow up, so that we can be nourished and nurtured and have stability in the storm. It's all about how we sink our roots into his love. Now what is love? English language, it's so rich. But there is one place where we, where we live in poverty and it's using the word love because when we've got lots of other words that we should be using, we usually slip love in instead. We should sometimes use the word lust instead say love. Sometimes we say love when we should say liking. It's possible to have infatuation and call it love incorrectly romance or love sex and love you know it's possible to have all of those things and love not be included now if you're in a relationship a close relationship then love should be woven through the way that we are but let's be cautious about how we understand what love is this is my definition and you can feel free to come up with another one and probably a better one Love, for me, is got nothing to do with how I feel, nothing to do with my emotions. Love is an action word. Love is about doing. It must be doing in order to be love. But it's possible to just have lots of action that's not loving. In order to be loving, it's doing the best. Nothing less than the best. Isn't that what God has done for us? For God so loved the world that he gave, a doing word, his only begotten son, the best that it was possible for the universe to offer. And what? For the other person. Love is not about me and what I get out of this relationship. Love is about doing the best 
for the other person for God so loved the world that he gave and if you're in a loving relationship it's less and less about me and more and more about the other whoever the other is and it doesn't have to be a marriage relationship any relationship can be a love relationship a mate relationship and it will cost guaranteed it will cost you something but when it's love you don't count that cost just it doesn't matter it's just I want to do the best for you and nothing else matters so there's one definition of love when we're rooted and grounded in love and love grows it does produce good fruit and out of that together with all God's people to grasp to get your head around to have some measure of understanding and again it's got nothing to do with IQ it's about grasping it's about getting it lots of <laughs> you don't <coughs> sorry I, I'm sort of teeing with the idea should we explore the idea of how good um, university you know, courses can be and degrees but we, we won't go there just look <laughs> Just, you've got to get it and you don't need a degree to, to get it, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. Because, I'm sorry, but you can't get it. It's beyond grasp. You grasp at it. You, you grope in it. But how big is the love of Christ? It, you can never grasp how wide it is, how long it is, how high it is, how deep it is. The love of Christ fills the entire universe and beyond. It fills eternity. It's far more than we could ever possibly get our head around. Our brain is this big and the universe is this big. To grasp that, to grasp, to know, to have the knowledge. The funny thing is that we're we're grasping at something that we could never possibly get our head around uh, to know this love that surpasses knowledge how can you know something that's unknowable but that's what we're doing we're, we're moving beyond knowledge to beyond knowledge and to be filled to be filled with what? to be filled with the fullness of God all the fullness of God no trouble for that to fill me but to be filled up with something so vast now, we are TARDIS people now that, that might be a bit obscure you know, Doctor Who and his phone box is the, the TARDIS it's bigger on the inside than the outside that's us, we're TARDIS people because on the outside we look so small and insignificant but inside we're filled up with the fullness of God beyond fullness there's a, there's a hymn that we sometimes sing. I serve, I serve a risen Saviour. You know the one? Good. Yeah, I don't need to sing, which is just as well. It ends, the chorus ends with the words, You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Now, for an outsider who's looking for just the hard logic, explain this to me, that doesn't make any sense. That's illogical. But when you're filled up with the fullness of God, when you grasp the love that's so high, wide, deep, beyond understanding, it makes perfect sense because it's not something to be explained. It's to be something experienced. There's the real key. Not explained, but experienced because... You can't measure love. How big is love? How high, wide, deep? It's beyond measurement. You can't put a weight to it or some sort of quantity measure. And that's how it is. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives in my experience of him day by day. And then I said there were three things. Here's number three. Oh God, I desire a heart for glory and this is this fabulous couple of verses in the end of the chapter a heart for glory 
<clears throat> now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever Amen? Amen, Amen to something like that Let's throw the six standard questions at it What's God doing? Immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Yeah. Manny shared just one example of that. A big example. More than he could possibly ask or imagine. And that's what he wants to do in each of us. In more than you could ask or imagine. So go ahead and imagine something. Imagine that God wants to do something in your life. Now, you don't have to tell anybody, but just go ahead and imagine. Now, something in your life, not something, you know, doesn't, forget the, oh, give me a parking spot every time I go out. Forget the, give me a million dollars. He wants to work inside you. If he could do something in you to change something about you, let your imagination run with that one because he wants to do something immeasurably more to transform who you are. How's he going to do it? According to his power that is at work within us. You don't have to ask for something new or fresh or uh, an external addition. Where is it? It's already at work within us. So I'm not going to show you what's under my shirt. That was probably a... No, no. <laughs> Let's just run with the graphic that we've got here. Put this image in your mind instead. <laughs> Each of us have the big S, the big supernatural that is within us. His power is already at work within us. We've got it now. It's here. We are supernaturally empowered because of what God is doing within us. Why? To him be glory. Not so that we can be seen as being fabulous or upfront or great at some skill. It's so that whatever, it's glory to him and not to us. That's so important. How does it work? Well, I need to do something to push through my humility so that we can have more of his glory because the two are inversely proportional. You're going to have one or the other. And as John the Baptist said, this is the fulfillment of my joy. And often we leave that bit out, but it's so important. It's the first half of what he's saying. This is the fulfillment of my joy. How do we fulfill joy? Jesus must become greater and I must become less. There's the, the key that makes all the difference. When he increases and I decrease, joy is the natural outcome of that relationship. Where does it happen? To him be glory. And notice it keeps coming up again and again. It's not about me personally. It's happening in the church. It's happening in us together. It's why we need to be together week after week. It's why we need to be together as we connect with one another through the week. It's why we need each other as a single body. This is where the glory is happening. When we are working together because we are the church. We are God at work. We are the glory of God. Look around. This is the glory of God. Salvation and transformation. This is what's making a difference for eternity. We are what the world desperately needs. Who is the key in all this? Not me. And not you. It's in Christ Jesus. Us in him, him in us, there's the transformational key element. It all hinges around him. And God's glory is in who Jesus is 
and what Jesus has done through his death and his resurrection because our sins are gone life is given and it happens in Christ at the cross when throughout all generations it's never going to be any different than this this is what it's always been this is what it always will be generation after generation after generation after generation God is at work in this way through all of us I love this photo and this is a beautiful quote one of my favourites out of the Old Testament the Lord your God he is God the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations you want the best for your children your grandchildren your great grandchildren how far down the track you're going to go God is faithful for thousands of generations and always has been one of my hobbies is family history and so I did a little tally and thought how many generations has it been since Jesus came any suggestions pick a, pick a number no don't calculate I, 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 I can see Steve's got the, the, the mental arithmetic here let me put you out of misery. At the most, 60. Only about 60 generations will take us back to Jesus. You know, if you really want to breed quickly, you, know, you can perhaps push it up to 100. And, and that would be the absolute, absolute maximum possible to have 100 generations. But God is faithful to 1,000 generations. But I'm sure he's not limiting that to, oh, well, that's it, 999. <laughs> The rest of you guys are in trouble. It's not like that. It's just a way of saying every generation and we are passing on to the next generation who follows us, not just our blood relatives, but the next generation and the one after that. We are passing on to a thousand generations the good news of who Jesus is. And it's, when's it happening? Not just through time, it's happening, I cheated, it's two wins. <laughs> Forever and ever. It's never going to end. It's not just to a thousand generations. It's not just through all generations. When time and space are finally wrapped up at the second coming, it's still going to go on. There's still going to be love and life and glory and then it will be bigger and better than we could ever possibly have begun to imagine right through our lives. And it's all about what Jesus is doing in us. This verse says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us. To what? To the glory of God. We are the Amen. We are the glory of God. He's at work amongst us. We, we are supernaturally empowered to be different and to make a difference in this world. And so to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, to him be glory in the church now and forever. Amen. Let me pray while someone turns uh, this air conditioning from cold to off. <laughs> Father God, thank you for the blessings that you have lavished upon us and continue to do so again and again and again and again and will do so throughout every generation that ever will be. Thank you for what you have done for us at the cross. Thank you for what you're doing in us through your indwelling Holy Spirit. Thank you for the equipping that is ours right now. May we allow Christ to dwell in our hearts by simply faith in him, that we might then find the outworking of your spirit, your power and your glorious gifts to make us different 
and to make the world different through us. So thank you for all the blessings that are ours and ever will be for now and forevermore. Amen.